All right, there we go. Hey, everybody. Doug Padgett here. David Moore over there. And uh, we're going to take just a second, as you know, when we post these Facebook status update or Facebook live updates, it takes a minute for Facebook to record that all over the country. And I just have to change the privacy here, David, and then you'll be able to share it all the places where you want. Cool. All right. Well, David is, uh, among other things, a scholar, a professor, a pastor, and now the author of uh, this fabulous book. David, congratulations on the book and all that you um, all that you're up to. Well, thank you very much, Doug. Thank you for um, hosting me, and thank you for the uh, the interviews you've been doing with the Trump supporter. Uh, oh. That's a, um, a, a Rubik's cube. We're all trying to get figured out. Well, thank you. Uh, any input you have for me on uh, how I should position myself or what I should talk to Adam about on, on Trump, I'd take it in a minute. Um, hey, uh, speaking of that, uh, you entitled your book "Making America Great Again," and then it's got this fun little subtitle: fairy tale? Question mark. Horror story? Question mark. Dream come true? Question mark. A challenge to the Christian community. Um, so I, I'm super interested in, um, in in why you framed it and made it look all, all Trump-like, other than, you know, I guess it's just a great marketing pitch, making America great again. Um, but before we jump into the book, I want people to get to know a little bit about you. So uh, I, I do want to ask you specifically about the book, and people should order it today and buy it and, and engage with it. Um, but tell people about what, what, what you do. You're in, you're in beautiful California, Southern California. And you, you, you pastor a church. Yeah, I pastor two churches. I live in Santa Barbara and uh, pastor a New Covenant church here in town. And then uh, every Sunday we, uh, we go down to Oxnard, my wife and I, um, where we lead a four-square church uh, called Church <laughs> for the Nations. Is that right? The church in, in uh, Santa Barbara is uh, Church of God in Christ. Uh-huh. Yeah, I didn't know you were also connected to a four-square church. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now th there's a couple of things that strike me about that. One is you don't look like your typical uh, Santa Barbara uh, resident and the kind of people that some of us imagine that are in Santa Barbara. Uh, you, what, what, what's the makeup of the church like? Is it uh, an African-American church? Is it a mixed-culture church? White? Well, it's, uh, it's always changing, but, uh, but Santa Barbara does not have very many African-Americans. In fact, uh, it's about 1% of the population. So our church pretty much reflects that to, to, to a great extent. Hmm. So for a lot of people, you are the one black friend that they have in Santa Barbara that they, that they hang out with. Uh, how, how, did, how did you end up there? You talk, I know you talk about this in the book. It's part of your story that you write about in the book. But I think it's really intriguing and interesting how, you, how your life ended up with you uh, pastoring, uh, you know, gr growing up in a tradition of black churches as you did. But now you're pastoring churches in, a church in Santa Barbara. And then one in Oxnard yeah. that that are, are different than that. Yeah, in fact, both of the both of the congregations are, are pretty diverse, uh, somewhat different because uh, Oxnard is more of a blue collar community, uh, more of a, a Latino community, even though Santa Barbara is, in fact, California is. Yeah. Um, but uh, I I came here uh, over three decades ago um, because there was a small church of about twelve people. Uh, African-American, uh, mostly old enough to be at that time uh, our grandparents. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a little bit larger percentage of uh, African-Americans in Santa Barbara uh, a couple of generations ago. Mm -hmm. They provided uh, service. They, they were the, uh, you know, the porters and the busboys and the mm -hmm. uh, housekeepers, things like that in this city, the gardeners. But that's something that's been uh, that, that's being fulfilled by the Latino community mostly mm -hmm. these days. Yeah, and and that that's a big part of your story, the the awakenings that you write about in uh, making America uh, great again. You, you you talk about your own spiritual development and kind of uh, waking up to the issues that are so prevalent in our society and um, but are sometimes hidden in, in our religious narratives. Yeah. Uh, well, at living here, I became part of the white evangelical community. Mm -hmm. uh, 
you know, if I was going to be a part of the church community, that was almost a given. Yeah. Um, but there were uh, certain cultural elements that were quite different from my black church upbringing. And, uh, and, and, and I started to buy into a lot of those uh, ideas and then started raising questions about those things that I had adopted. Yeah. You, you, you tell this, I have a great line. In fact, I, I pulled it out in here. Um, you write, uh, I think I could have been a successful white evangelical. I read the right books, committed to memory all the verbiage, attended the right events and kept the right company. I could have done well, but for those damned questions. And uh, yeah, they just, they just weren't going to let you go. Um, that, in some ways, this book is, uh, it's, it's a memoir, isn't it? Like you're, you're really telling your, your story. If someone just saw the cover, they might think it's a, you know, a commentary on the current political situation alone, but um, it's, it's much more but than it's that. Not, yeah. it's, it's not that. It, it's to get the attention of, of the, first of all, the evangelical community, um, and then to, uh, I say it this way, I'm not trying to start an argument with people. I'm trying to start an argument within people. Hmm. Well, how, how do you mean? What's, what, what, what's the difference? Uh, I, I, instead of me arguing with people, I want to, to raise some, some thoughts, some consciousness, so that people will argue with themselves, as I have done. I see. Years. I see. You mean you you mean you want to start that argument within a person, the the the, the thing that that starts to stir up in them and 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 doesn't leave them alone at night. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what the, the the book is by is biographical. Each of the chapters have the sense of I am this. Uh, you know, I am I am that. Um, you're trying to arc your story um, to help people who are in a. Uh, in a Christian community of some kind to see themselves differently in the world. I, I, at least that, th those are my words around what I think the book is doing. Um, what is that predicament that you see us uh, in as, as people in the world that we find ourselves in right now? Uh, you know, I went to the women's March uh, the day after the inauguration. Yeah. Uh, and it was, uh, it was uh, declared to be the largest thing Santa Barbara has ever had. Wow. You know, beyond concerts, uh, you know, whatever has happened here. Um, there were 7,500. Mm -hmm. So pretty, pretty big event. Yeah. And uh, I got a chance to, to speak. And uh, I, I asked everybody to look around and I said, you don't see many pe people of color here. And, um, and I said, the, the, the reason is, 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 is because these are thoughts and, concepts and fears that we've been trying to tell you about our whole life. Yeah. Um, and so for, for us to see this abrupt outrage among whites and white mm. women, you know, in particular, um, just, it, it's not as attractive to us. Wow. You know, I have heard that. Uh, I've heard that a number of times and I got to tell you the first few times I heard it um, I've, in different versions of it, of, people in black communities expressing, Hey, look, this is, this isn't news for us. Welcome to, welcome to Tuesday. You know, um, I was quite dismissive of that. Frankly, I, I, I was, I said things, you know, out loud and to myself internally like, Oh, well, okay. I know that it's not brand new, but I think it's really something. Uh, it's, it's some, it is something new, you know, it might not be brand. Um, and I've become convinced over the last uh, that I've started hearing those kinds of commentaries about the last year and a half, even before the election. Um, and uh, I'm convinced I'm totally wrong about that. Uh, it is it is the same. It is the same dilemma that's been going on. And uh, what's new is me to this arena, you know, and, into this experience. That is that's a hard that's a hard um, reality to um, to come to grips with. I mean, not, not, not with a lot of guilt or, or that's not what I mean. It's not hard to have to come to that reality. It just takes a lot to get someone yeah. to that place. Yeah. Well, you know, when, when you, you don't have to go back uh, 20 years, you just go back to last year and you look at the clown car that was the GOP uh, slate of candidates. And, and you know that something is, there's a tremendous dysfunction. That's the best that they could produce. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
How come you, uh, you, you framed your book in the, in the lens of making America great again? Uh, you know, fair, fairy tale, horror story, dream come true. Why, why, why did you pick that frame? Um, because it, it feels a little bit like, uh, oh, there is something new that happened with all this. Uh, is, is that why? Because you're trying to connect it back to 1916? And... No, in fact, it was not my original title of choice. Uh-huh. In fact, uh, uh, that phrase is in the book yeah. that um, some people want to make America great again. For some, it's a fairy tale, others a horror story. So that's, that phrase is in the book. And when uh, Brian McLaren, who wrote the foreword to my book, when he read my manuscript, he thought that should be the title. Uh. I was really reluctant to change it because my previous title had been amused to me as I wrote the book. Yeah, well, and what was the previous title? Okay, so now I got to tell you why I came, how I came up with the previous. I, I, I love this. This is like asking, you know, each parent what you really wanted to name the child. This is where you really <laughs> find out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, there's a, a Guamanian guy. He was born in Guam in our church. Mm -hmm. And um, he was adopted by loving white parents who, uh, th who lived in Arizona. So he grew up in Arizona in a conservative a uh, very conservative white religious community. Mm -hmm. And they were not very receptive to this family uh, simply because they had a kid who was a little darker than, than uh -huh. everybody. Uh -huh. And one day they woke up to find a cross burning on their lawn. Oh. And so he was pretty resistant to anything Christian. And so one day he and I were having coffee. He, he asked me, uh, I, you know, he said, uh, I never saw myself as being one of those people who go to church all the time because he was, you know, he was actually doing the video at our church and says, I never, and I, he said, I, I guess I needed to find a place where God's not an asshole. And um, so that was going to be the title originally and it energized me as I wrote. Yeah. The God, it was going to be God's not an asshole. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I want I want to hear because I've read about it in the book, but I want to hear your telling of the stories of of this transition because you the kinds of people in this 1980s and 90s that you were uh, finding yourself around, kind of your typical run of the mill evangelical radio kind of conservative evangelicals. Yeah. Um, uh, and w were were you always someone who said I don't know that this fits me all that well this way of viewing the world and this this because I I have well I'll tell you my bias I have a bias that for a lot of people it's the conservative part of the evangelical thing that's that's problematic it's uh, there's part, there's that evangelical spirit of caring about other people having personal transformation in someone's life wanting to create the context in which the good news is is uh, felt by everyone uh, however we experience the good news that the life we live now is just as important as anything that could ever happen in the future. Those are all things that kind of manifest in a in an enlivened evangelical spirit. Then it gets combined with this conservatism. So is is that what was happening with you? Were you feeling this this bound up ness on the conservative side, or what what was it that started to really trouble your spirit? I think that what appealed to me is uh, you know the, the, was the intersection of uh, coming from a Pentecostal, uh, a holiness background with the desire to, to live a pure life. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it was, a lot of it was a purity thing because this was a big deal for evangelicals, yeah. especially in the area of sex and sexuality. Mm -hmm. um, and then I began to see that there was such an emphasis on that, uh, that it left out too much of the, the gospel. Mm. Hmm. Yeah, um, you know, for example, um, the, 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 we, we live in a very violent society, um, but we're a, we indulge violence in sports and in film. Uh, we, we indulge it. And I've, you know, I've told people, you know, I'm not going to indulge in that stuff, but I'm not telling you not to. And I'm not trying to shame you for doing it. However, I would ask you not to shame the people who are into pornography because it's the same thing. Wow. Talk about that. How, how, how do you mean? You, you mean there's a, there's a thing in the, in the sexualized part of pornography that 
plays out in the same way as the the well, spectacle it's about it? it's about body chemicals. I mean, I noticed that the reason that I would watch an NFL game or the reason I would watch boxing mm -hmm. things like that is because of the adrenaline, what yeah. it does for me. Okay, and uh, and when I stopped doing, I noticed a, an actual biological change and spiritual change in my life mm. that, uh, that brought me to a more centered way of being. And so again, I don't tell everybody to stop doing that because I, I told our congregations, I said that that's like a monk taking a, a vow of silence. Now everybody shut up. You know, I'm, <laughs> I, you know, I'm, I, that's. But I, I'm just, you know, I'm just saying this is what has appealed to it about me. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, uh, the church is very silent about mm. violence. Yes, uh, that's right. We know that we know that our country has 25 percent of the prison population. Yeah. But we also ha of the world, you know, with only five percent of the population. But we also have half the guns in the world, and that's mm -hmm. just the civilians. And um, and we don't know it. We can't see the forest for the trees. We're so fully immersed in a violent culture that we consider it a triumph if we can have fewer than a thousand police killings in a year, police killing people. But there are countries that are trying to get that number under one. They're trying to get it down to zero, you know, in Scandinavia and Japan and places yeah. like that. Yeah. But, but, but I will hasten to say this is not a strictly a police problem this you know i would i wouldn't want to be a policeman unarmed in our society the problem it's you know to, to say that the police are the problem like is like asking your uh podiatrist to to treat your skin disease or you yeah. know your gynecologist to to set your bones or yeah. you know yeah well, i have a lot of thoughts about that i'd love to we we need to talk more because i i'm with you i think there's so many like there's a whole culture around policing that is about fear and violence and so if if there's anything true that guns don't kill people on their own people have to be engaged in that yeah the problem isn't that the police should be unarmed the problem is the police need to have a different perspective about the people they're engaging with yeah it seems to me right yeah. that that killing someone shooting someone is not the uh, should not be the go-to and it didn't i don't know it didn't used well, it to be doesn't ultimately solve anything uh, no. you know it may solve something in the in the short run but ultimately it, it continues to contribute to a culture of violence yeah now this book itself is a challenge to the christian community well, how how do you say what that challenge is what what are you challenging a christian community in this age that we find ourselves you know in late you know in in late fall 2017 what what is that christian challenge what was the challenge to that christian community well, because I've been a part of this community for so long, uh, not just locally, but just part of the whole culture, yeah. um, I have uh, compassion. So my critique is not one who is uh, at a distance from all of them. I'm not lobbing bombs over the fence and, and that kind of thing. Um, I'm trying to engage, but I'm being very, uh, you know, very frontal about it. Yeah. yeah. What... Where, where, where are those, where are those uh, front, front edges of that engagement? What's, what's your sense of, of the, the places where that engagement needs to happen most uh, directly? A term that I use uh, frequently in the book is the supremacy of the Christian West. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, um, that we, we have blinders on as far as the planet is concerned. Uh, we, we don't understand, and we use language uh, that's inflammatory with regard to other parts of the world. And uh, we, we lack a curiosity. Um, the Christian community, I'm not talking about yeah. Americans, I'm talking about the, the American Christian community. The uh, Christian West supremacy uh, pretty, pretty much sees itself as being the model for being on yeah. the planet. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what, what, what are your thoughts about what we can do about that? I, I, I agree so much with that with that critique, and you, I, I found myself paralyzed sometimes trying to wonder, like, well, this is the only culture that people have grown up in. It's the only one they know. Uh, how does anybody get outside of that culture that they know so well and that they've embedded their Christian imagination into? How do they free those two from one another if what they have is primarily only access to the culture that they were that they were raised in well i, I think it it may begin with the people who are 
on the fence, or if not on the fence, uh, trying to trying to maintain a demeanor of courtesy, mm. uh, of of making sure they don't offend anybody. Um, I, I think mm. that uh, we have reduced our culture war to something where you know there are some people who think they're right, and the other, and there are other people who think they're right, yes. and it's not really reducible to that. Um, it comes down to there are some things that are wrong and there are some things that are right. Yeah. And we have to pick. So you, you're saying there's a, that the way to get someone out of their cultural norm that they find themselves in is for someone else to come and shake that up a bit. Yeah, it has to be with, deter, with conviction, passion and determination. Mm. In the same way that, uh, you know, uh, I, one of my models is the freedom movement of the 50s and 60s in, 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 in this country. And uh, there had to be tremendous determination. They had songs like, ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, or I, um, I shall not be moved, or yeah. shall overcome. Yeah. Uh, most most African Americans did not participate in the marches. They'd rather listen to it on the radio and watch it on TV. Mm. Um, and what I'm saying is that with the current culture conflict that we're in now, we need people to stop be, being spectators. Yeah. Uh, and they need to get into it. They need to become activists. Yeah. So uh, for knowing the, the evangelical community so well and the, 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 this just odd, set, odd fear of being overly activist about, I don't know, like earthly things and yeah. so willing to be activist about, well, maybe some select earthly things, but sort of another life, uh, afterlife kind of thing. Um, what have you found motivates or helps someone to start to be more bold or to be more loud or to be more out um, that, that you think people could share with each other? Like, like what, what, what helps them come out a little bit more? Bold and out, okay? What causes a person to become bolder and more forward is another person who is bolder huh. and forward, huh. who does it with grace and with dignity. Nice, yeah. Because it, it it does it feels like something's brewing. It, it to me it feels that way anyway. Maybe, maybe that's just hopeful, you know, reshaping. Uh, but I really do feel that there's something stirring in the conscience of our country that want that where, where more people are feeling more comfortable to be out with their with their demands on society one of the things that i fear is that a lot of people who have a uh a jesus oriented or a progressive evangelical kind of sensibility to them that there's still so much fear about f sounding like that old story or sounding like that bad version that they want have wanted to get rid of that their faith orientation their faith conversation their faith narratives end up being left behind so that when they're going to be out, um, nothing of their own personal life or faith or their, their, their sense of what uh, a good news for all the planet and for everyone everywhere could possibly look like. Yeah. And I would say they have to fish or cut bait. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this, you know, this is not time to, to navel gaze. This is, we are living in a very urgent moment and, and, and lives are at stake. I mean, mm -hmm. Physical lives are at stake. You know, yeah. it's sometimes in the Christian world, we're really concerned about souls, yeah. right? But uh, but physical lives are important. Mm -hmm. And we're living in a time uh, where it's important for people who, who are just meandering and talking and having conversations to be more intentional about waking up, about their own personal consciousness, and then waking up the rest of the community that's around them. You have a little line at the beginning of the book where you say something about I, I'm I'm not sure when I when I uh, was awakened to these or if I even knew if I was sleeping or something like that. There's some line in there, right? Where like this recognition that sometimes people don't even know there's a thing to be awakened to, right? They're just it's so they're so unconscious, right? And we all are in some ways. The things we didn't even know were a thing all of a sudden find themselves in our lives. You can, I sort of think about people who are diagnosed with a, with a disease or with an illness or something, right? And they didn't know anything about that illness. And all of a sudden they are in 
all the way, right? Uh, that happens to people. That that kind of that kind of awakening. For those who find themselves in that sort of wokeness, that are trying to, um, I don't know, shake the slumber out of the the people around them. Uh, that idea of doing it with dignity. Can you talk a little bit about that? How you, one does that work with passion and with force, forthrightness, and with dignity? Like like that's. That's a real trick. Yeah, I think it can be discovered. It can be discovered within us. Mm. And uh, that discovery uh, will reveal to us our oneness, our essential oneness as a human family. Mm. And so if you're going to fight for anything, mm -hmm. you're not going to, your conscience, a growing conscience will allow you to fight for inclusivity, for the deprived and the people who are hanging on by their fingernails and dying and desperate, your conscience will support you in this. You're going to have to climb over your conscience. If you're only going to fight for your group, your in group, uh -huh. you know, your, your religion, uh, your race or whatever it is, but there's something that's liberating to the conscience. When you say, you know what, if we're going to war, I'm going to fight for all of us. Mm -hmm. hey, and one of the, the chapter had in the book uh, is under the, the the big section. I am a human being, which is a, I mean, it's a very that's a very powerful and provocative statement, especially around the issues of of race and slavery in this country. Right to have to start a book with a chapter that says I'm a human being, and then you go on with with others that are I am not a loser. I'm a skeptic. I'm all in for Jesus. I'm a global citizen. I am I am ashamed and I'm not who you think I am in that little section uh, of I am a human being. One of the, the sections is so what do I call myself? And, and I was struck by that because I think a lot of this struggle we have has to do with identity. And I think a lot of people don't know where to turn for their identity. And it's um, you mix that with a sense of not wanting to label or be labeled, which are both happening in our society. And you really get this sense where people end up without an identity or feeling like they don't have one or they don't know what to do. How do you think about or refer to yourself when you talk about yourself sort of in your, maybe in your out religiousness in the world? Yeah. And see, this is, this goes back to uh, recognizing our essential oneness. It's so important to start there mm -hmm. uh, because everything else is so easily objectified. Nice. Uh, you know, even the word God is so objectified and, Truth, a word like truth. You know, if I say I'm seeking the truth, uh, that's objective. Those words are as objectified as a woman at a Harvey Weinstein um, house party. Yeah. And so those terms don't really have the cachet that they would need uh -huh. in order to connect us. If we really want to be connected, uh -huh. if we want to be connected, I have to acknowledge that I am, if I'm going to accept the category, uh, that I am you. Yes. So when, when, when someone says, uh, David, you don't like this, this kid at, at your church. Uh, I, I, I didn't know I was going to be in one of these places. I didn't know there was a place where people talked about God like that. And you tell that, a story like that in the book too. Like, I, I didn't know there was a place like this. Um, how do you refer to yourself? Do you say I'm Christian? Do you say I'm Pentecostal? I'm evangelical. I'm progressive. What do you say? I'm all of those things, but you know what? Nice. Uh, I call Fran Pope Francis my Pope. Uh, you, you know, I uh, I have a friend, one of my closest friends here in town. In fact, he's spoken at our church, and I've I spoke uh, for him for Yom Kippur two years ago. Is a rabbi. I call him my rabbi. Yeah. Uh, I I just don't I, I don't allow myself to 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 get stuck in those places. Mm -hmm. I don't need to. my humanity is more important to me than my category. Yeah, that's nice. That's nice. Do, um, for, for people who feel that, you know, what, what a lot of people uh, that I know worry about is um, they really don't want to be alone, right? That's a, that's a big deal. And they'll stay quiet in situations uh, just to not yeah. be alone. Uh, do you think this, this, this bit of, do, do you think there's any struggle with the interconnected oneness notion that we want all of us to recognize and to know and to be rooted from when it comes to that sense of feeling like you belong because a lot of people struggle with putting those two things together a belonging and uh and, and a overall interconnectedness 
I, I, you know, I get that. And I, you know, I encounter that and, and people are actually terrified over not belonging to something small. Yeah. You know, the thing is, is that when you can belong to the biggest thing, it's, <laughs> it's That's great. <laughs> Why would you give you know? that up? What are the tricks for somebody to start to shift from having a mindset where they only know how to belong to the small to knowing how they belong to the, to the all? For, for me, I, I, I think that the biggest contributor to, uh, to, to my growth in consciousness and, and waking up has been the contemplative tradition. And that's why in the acknowledgments of my, uh, acknowledgements of my book, I, I point out that, uh, that especially Catholic um, um, contemplatives have influenced my life over the past, um, past decade plus, and it, it's really transformed me. Hmm. How, how, how have you used it? Are you, are you in, do you, do you use particular practices or do you, do you meditate? Do you pray? Do you yeah. do the rosary? Centering prayer Centering is prayer? big in my life. You know, even though I've been a pastor all of these years, um, I've told our churches, I used to hate prayer. Yeah. Uh, I used to, I'm not like, I, I'm not saying I didn't do it. I just hate it. Yeah. All right. <laughs> it's, like, it's like taking a shower. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it's like, um, I, there were times when I would go to a private place and spend the day in prayer. And at the end of the day, I felt miserable. Hmm. And, and here was my issue. I found out that as an empath, the empath that I am, yeah. I was just loading myself down with problems. Um, you know, in, in the guise of giving them to God, I was taking them on faster than I was giving them away. Wow, yeah. And so when I learned centering prayer, uh, it had the reverse effect. Instead of burdening me, burdening me down, it began to release me. And uh, I was able to be more clear-headed and therefore more forthright and confident in who I am. Mm -hmm. Do the people in your, in your church uh, do that with you? Or do you pass that along to the people in the churches? Or are you, uh, do you just, does it come to the people, do you share it only with the people who come to you to, 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 to learn about it? Like, is it a part of the fabric? A little, a little of both. You know, there are times when I will, you know, thematically address it, but, uh, you know, just like for me, I mean, I don't know how long it's been in the world, you know, it's been on the world from the beginning, but then we've had people in recent history, like, uh, Thomas Merton, uh, and, and other contemplatives who I was aware of and even read, but it didn't, it sure. didn't affect my life. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, hey, this uh, this book I think is super helpful. Um, if if people want to find more about you in the other spaces and places in the world, how, how how do they do that? If they're not, you know, maybe they could drive to Oxnard, or maybe they can find their way over to Santa Barbara or something. But it, uh, other than that, are you writing things? Are you podcasting? Do you have a do you have a live stream somewhere? What are you yeah, doing? Yeah, you know. I would love to do those things, but as um, a pastor of two churches and an adjunct professor and a very involved advocate and activist in yeah. my local region, it doesn't leave a lot of uh, daylight for those things. Um, so uh, for me, a primary, uh, one of my primary platforms is my Facebook page. Yeah. Uh, so I do a lot of... Um, um, Facebooking seasonally. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> See, you, mean, you mean like in the fall, you put on fall, fall colors and then in the spring, <laughs> you come up with some white pants. And... Well, no, just seasonally in the I sense say, that yeah, I got uh, it, yeah. for Lent, I, I completely disengaged uh, yeah. from all social media, through tw you know, Twitter and yeah. Instagram and everything. Um, but uh, there are times when I'm very active and involved there. Um, and that's pretty much it at this point. And on Facebook, you're David N. Moore? Yes. With that middle initial, because there's a few David Moores in the world. So David N. Moore uh, is how you find that. Well, boy, if there's any chance you could ever grab in, in those church meetings you're doing or any teaching you're doing or other things you're doing and send that out to the rest of the world in some kind of a stream or a podcast or video or oh, something, I think well, it would be just great. You know, our, our, uh, my, my Sunday talks are recorded at our church website, um, ncwc.net as in new covenant worship center.net uh -huh. ncwc.net okay. so those are up every week great great and uh and what's that what's that style like what what's your what's your uh what are your sunday teachings like what do you do well 
I just love doing this. Uh, I, I present the theme. Uh, it's, it's, it's biblical. Um, you know, I, I start with the scripture. A lot of it is um, rethinking how you know, cultural understanding of yeah. scripture. But um, we, and then we have a conversation. I open the floor. Um, and so, I, you know, I just love doing that. It's great. I, I do a very similar thing at our church. It's hard to get a good recording of that all the time, though. How does it work yeah. at your place? Is it okay? No, it, it, you know, you don't get a good recording of that last part. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's really, it's really something. Uh, well, well, David, I, I'm really, uh, I'm really proud to to be your friend and to tell people about this book. I think it's great, and um, I'm going to be in Southern California in January, so maybe we should, uh, maybe we should connect. Oh, we we have coffee shops. Hey, in fact, uh, yeah, I'm helping to run a class for uh, a Master's of Divinity degree that uh, I've helped to manage called the Open MDiv. So it's for students that are taking a master's degree uh, in MDiv, but also for people who just want to continue to learn at a high level. So yeah. it's, a, it's a week-long learning thing. I would love to get you up for that Yeah. to, to do something. It's going to be up in uh, southern L.A. Okay. So you'd come slumming up there, wouldn't you? Yeah, that's not if that far. could make it work. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's January 22nd through the 26th. That, that week like in there. Period. That week. All I right. have to say, Doug, you're, you're good at what you do. Yeah, thanks. Say more about that. No, I'm just kidding. That's nice of you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, hey, uh, I really look forward to that. And uh, yeah, this, that, that really, makes me, uh, really makes me interested to connect you into that, uh, into that course and some other things we're doing out there. So, hey, congratulations. Thank you.